Cancer Med, Med University. Um, today, Dr. Nushin Karimian will be your host. She will chair the session. I am Magda Giordano, the Academic Secretary for Enes Curiquilla, and thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Karimian. Thank you very much. Uh, buenos dias to our colleagues in Mexico, and good afternoon to everyone who has joined us from uh, UK. Uh, it's a very sunny Manchester here. It's not very likely to get a sun in Manchester, but it's a good start. Um, I'm uh, happy to um, to um, welcome our first speaker, Mr. Segun uh, Popula. Uh, Mr. Segun Popula received his BTEC degree in electronic and electrical engineering from the Ladok um, Akitola University of Technology in Nigeria and the MH degree in, engine, in information and communication engineering from the Department of Electrical and Information Engineering at uh, University in Nigeria. He's currently pursuing a PhD degree at the School of Engineering, Faculty of Science and Engineering uh, in Manchester Metropolitan University here in the UK. He was a lecturer with the Department of Electrical and Information um, in Covenant University. His research interests uh, include wireless communications, machine deep learning, cybersecurity, and the Internet of Things. He has published research papers in reputable peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings, including the IEEE Internet of Things Journal, IEEE Access, Neurocomputing, Elsevier, Wireless Personal Communications, Springer, Cogen Engineer and Taylor and Francis, amongst others. He also serves as a reviewer for top journals and conferences. He is a registered engineer with the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria. So without further ado, I would like to pass on to our invited speaker, Mr. Sekun Popula. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Nushin. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, can I confirm that you can all see my slide? Yes, we can. All right, thank you very much. So um, my name is Shegun Pukwola. And like how I've been introduced, I'm doing my PhD in the Department of Engineering, Manchester Metropolitan University. And at the, at the end of the, my second year, uh, the title of my presentation this afternoon here in the UK and morning over there is uh, Federated Deep Learning for Botnet Attack Detection in Critical Infrastructure. Okay. Now, um, looking at critical infrastructure in the UK, according to excuse me, according to the Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure. Uh, national infrastructure are those facilities, systems, sites, information, people, network and processes that are necessary for a country to function and upon which daily activities depend. So those are national critical infrastructure. And according to that body, which is the Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure, they coin out 13 sectors that are under this category, which include the chemicals, um, civil, nuclear, communications, defense, emergency services, energy, uh, finance, food, government, health, space, transport, and water. So these are critical infrastructure because uh, the citizen depends on these, uh, this infrastructure. But of late, we discovered that the technology has advanced and there's this, apart from the traditional internet, we now have the internet of things, whereby uh, things like machines, like traffic lights, like uh, sensors, uh, smart sensors in health sector that is fixed on maybe aged people or yeah, can now communicate directly with other devices. And now we have intercommunication, not just you and I communicating together, but we have devices and machine empowered to communicate with each other via the internet. That is the internet of things. But the problem we have here is that there has not been standardization of this technology 
enough because um, it is cheap, uh, that is low cost. Now that has led to, and its, uh, its adoption is growing faster in diverse application areas. So there are different security vulnerabilities in this uh, technology. And because they are using national critical infrastructure, that exposed those infrastructure to cyber attacks. And to back that hub recently, we've seen smart grids in the US and in, in, in other parts of the, of, the, of the world being attacked by cyber terrorists. You know, uh, in the future, the war of the future will no longer be fought by guns. The war of the future will be fought using the internet. And we must try to uh, secure the, the infrastructure. Imagine if smart grid, the grid, national grid of electricity in the UK is shut down, lives will be affected, it means of livelihood, trains will be grounded, and that's, that's the consequence. So one major form of that attack is IoT botnet attack. So people leverage the security vulnerability in IoT devices and recruit a lot of them that are scattered, distributed across different ge uh, geographical locations and use them to form a network of boats. And that you can also call zombies so that you mobilize them like soldiers to attack a particular infrastructure. And that has happened. And that has happened, that happened in 2016 and it shut down uh, critical services like Netflix, like CNN and others. So that's the consequence of cyber attacks. Now, different ways by which uh, these attacks have been mitigated. We have authentication, uh, access control and other things. But the ones that we are looking at currently that I'm looking at in my PhD is the application of machine learning and deep learning. So the difference between, if you look at uh, this, um, the, the, the image at the bottom is showing the architecture of machine learning and deep learning. So you see the difference between them is just the depth of the eating layer. So the diagram, the image at the right hand side is just showing um, the architecture of how cyber attacks happens using the Internet of Things. So I need to move now to the next slide. So we try to, as in other, any other uh, meaningful research, you do your literature review and related works. And we discover that um, the state of art deep learning methods fall into uh, four different categories centralized deep learning, localized deep learning, distributed deep learning, and federated deep learning. But what we discover is that centralized deep learning, localized deep learning, and distributed deep learning, they violate the privacy of data because there's no machine learning without aggregation, without data. You have to learn from the pattern of data. And when you are doing that, you don't want to breach the data privacy of the users. And looking at the example of GDPR that is now in place in European, uh, European Union now, it has a lot of consequence if you breach that. So federated learning is just a method of applying deep learning without bridging the data privacy of users. So we've uh, adopted the methods, the previous method, centralized deep learning, and the published papers are listed here. We've published in three outlets. And concerning federated learning, we try to review the uh, state of the heart works, and those are the ones in the table that I have at the right hand side. We have 10 major ones, but the research gap there is that they've not considered IoT traffic in their data set. And also, they are not looking particularly into botnet attack scenarios. And also there's what we call zero day scenarios, attack that has never happened before. How do you detect that if it's happened for the first time? So those are the things that informed uh, the research we are now doing. These are the aim and the objective is to develop federated deep learning methods for zero day botnet detection in IoT edge devices. And these are the objectives of this research. And uh, so we try to set up because IoT, Internet of Things, is a network of distributed devices. So we try to experiment with five different devices and then train the model locally and aggregate the model in a cloud server. So by doing that, the data that is private to individual user 
is not leaving their devices because in conventional machine learning, you have to aggregate that data onto the cloud. So if you are taking data from my device and storing on cloud, anything can happen along the way of transmission. And even in the cloud, the privacy of data can be intruded. So you can use that kind of application in, in, health, in health scenario when privacy is very, very important. So we try to do this and see if we can achieve deep learning without assessing the data of the individual. So this is the algorithm that was used. And these are the hyperparameters. So we try to structure our data set in this way to ensure that there are unique, if you look at ED1, DDoS attack did not have any sample before. So we want to ensure that we are able to detect attack that has not happened before, even if they are happening faster so that we don't leave anything to chance. So we try to simulate this using Python programming language and uh, scaling and other uh, deep learning framework. And we achieve this result. We saw that from this graph, after the uh, five communication rounds, the accuracy, the precision, the recall, and the F1 score, which are the metrics for measuring your effectiveness of your model, are very high because the higher, the better, and they are in percentages. So we got this result, then we compared it, our result with existing the other method, decentralized deep learning, localized deep learning, distributed deep learning. And we saw that it has a good, um, a very good performance compared to CDL, but without bridging the data privacy of individuals. Centralized, we bridge the data privacy. So that's the advantage. Other ones are lower in performance. So this is the training. So the side effect of this method is that it involves the training time. The time to train this model is higher. That's the cost of doing that. So we have to have a trade-off. Do you want to protect privacy or you want to spend more time training your model? So uh, and also the against uh, CDL, the memory space required is lesser. So that's another advantage. Then to conclude, these are just in summary using tables. We try to compare in terms of data aggregation. FDL does not need data aggregation. That's why it's good for uh, cases whereby you want to protect um, users' privacy. And this, these are just what we find out at the end of our research. And um, yeah, the, um, this is where I'm doing my PhD. I acknowledge MMU. And Sare Tech, who is a company that is sponsoring this PhD. Um, these are the references that I cited in the. Thank you for listening. So uh, I'm Thank done. You. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, are there any questions? We don't have any questions on the on the chat, but I had one. Um, when you say that you can, this model can be trained without accessing the data, you know the 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 private data, then. What kind of information does it use? Um, you know, how do you teach it hmm. if you can't, if you don't have any? I mean, what kind of you have to get some data, not the private data, but some what, some data. Yeah, you're correct. If you want to train a model to perform a task, you have to train it with a data set that is uh, gotten from that scenario. Yeah. What I mean, let me just clarify that. What I mean is that the data will be accessed, but the model training, instead, the conventional machine learning is that you aggregate the data from different sources and then combine them in a centralized place, which is in the cloud. So you have access to data of different people, but we are saying, no, you are not going to send your data to me. I'll bring my model to you, train it on your device, then I will live with the model without living with your data. I see. Does that I answer see. your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes it very clear. So it goes, yeah. learns, and then goes away, but it doesn't take it. It's it's like you don't put it all in 
just to use a very simple example, in Excellent. the same Excel sheet. I mean, Excellent. you don't you don't download it into one. You Excellent. just go. Oh, great. That Correct. sounds very yeah. good. Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a great presentation. Thanks very much for also the good question. Uh, it's always great to ask good questions, uh, as I'm sure it will be beneficial for everyone. Um, great. If there are no questions on our YouTube and on Facebook, uh, we can move on to our next speaker. Is that OK? Yeah. OK, great. So. Um, Our next speaker is um, Mrs. Uh, Said Adil. Uh, Said Adil is a doctor researcher. He's working with World Rugby to improve the regulations for body padding using material testing and finite element modeling. He holds an undergraduate degree in mechatronics engineering from SRM University and an MSc in Sports Engineering from Sheffield Hallam University. He has worked as a design engineer and a sport engineer researching into hockey, tennis, and now rugby. So again, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And without further ado, I would like to pass on to our second invited speaker. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see my slides as well. Yes, yeah. we do. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Ashwin. Uh, my research is into uh, modeling padded clothing that's used in rugby and updating the regulation for them. So um, I think, yeah. So um, the process uh, started off by looking at the Regulation 12, which governs the body padding that is allowed in the sport of rugby. Now, um, if you look at the uh, regulations in rugby, uh, we critique the literature and the uh, regulation that is existing, and we found three areas of concern. Uh, that's the padding area, the density, and the impact testing. Um, now, um, we'll go through each one of them. So the padding area, uh, in the regulation, there is a certified area where padding is allowed. That's on the left-hand side of my screen. Um, well, the regulation states padding can only be on the shoulder area and not anywhere else. But um, there are loopholes in the regulation text which allow manufacturers to put padding all over the jersey without even having to meet any impact criteria. So that was one of the first... Uh, areas we found that was concerning. The other thing is the density criteria. Now, if you read the regulation, the regulation states the density of the material used for padding has to be under 60 kilograms per meter cube. Now, um, if you look at the padding, uh, it's usually not uniform. It's sometimes hexagonally structured, which has different uh, padding thicknesses all throughout the cross section, sometimes triangular, they use these uh, shapes because it helps fit better on a shoulder joint or um, across the body. And sometimes you find a very geometry across the padding, uh, which makes it harder to test for density. So beyond that, the third thing we found that was a concern was the impact testing. Now the impact test set up in the regulation defines uh, a steel plate dropping onto a steel anvil and you place um, the padding in the middle to check if it does not offer too much protection. Now, it is not, um, you know, you'd never find a steel on steel impact during a rugby game. So it, it's, it is a little bit unrealistic. It is repeatable, but um, uh, unrealistic. And the shoulder padding that is there is only allowed to reduce uh, risk of cuts and lacerations. Again, uh, a flat impact between two steel objects will not replicate um, a cut or a laceration that may occur. So based on our findings, uh, uh, the area of concern, we, we did some testing. Um, the first thing we looked at was compliance versus density. Now, um, 
we carried out simple um, compliance testing where we compressed the padding using two uh, flat plates to look at how compliant the material is or how soft or stiff the material might be. Um, and then we carried out some density testing by cutting out um, paddings from um, the given padding we have. And you expect to get, you know, uniform circular uh, cylindrical structures, which you could calculate the weight, um, the mass and the volume and get the density of. But in reality, you get structures which are warped cylinders and uh, measuring them leads uh, to error in you know, density calculations and um, you know higher error in measuring the final density of the material. Our findings uh, from this study showed that density as a, as a regulatory material property is quite variable or er erroneous. Um, you only test the material, not the final product, and usually our foams are stuck between two layers of fabric and it does not provide any meaningful information. Whereas compliance, on the other hand, is quite, quite straightforward. You can write a program on a universal test machine and it would do the test for you. You test the final product, uh, the material and the fabric in um, combination as to what a player would wear during the game and it complements the impact testing. So one is uh, a low speed compression test, one is a high speed impact test. So uh, we published this and it, it is an open access paper um, in the um, sports engineering um, conference. Um, one of the other things we did was develop a bifidelic impact test. Now the impact test that is there, steel on steel, not, not very realistic. Um, this project is working in combination with a researcher at the University of Sheffield. Now Angus developed uh, a, a test bed which is mimicking the shoulder area, uh, a rigid core, um, with a muscle layer and a skin layer on top. And um, we carried out some stud impact testing to mimic what would actually happen uh, if uh, a human skin is comes in contact with the stud, which is usually worn in the game of rugby. So uh, we carried out some impact testing and uh, I'm just showing the video of a perpendicular impact, but we did uh, impacts at different angles as well. Now, uh, using this data, uh, we were um, we were able to carry out some FE simulations. So the simulations we did was um, based on the muscle and skin simulant, which Angus developed. We did some material testing, built our um, different material models, um, and then uh, carried out some testing with the stud coming down to, to see what would happen and uh, introduced element deletion criteria to mimic the injury that would occur in the human skin tissue. So uh, again, FE simulations are an easier way of simulating uh, such uh, injuries because we'd never get ethics for uh, testing out on humans and impacting them with stuff to see how their skin reacts. So um, we've, we've validated this model against uh, our impact testing at different angles and we've been able to run simulations. So let's say we can introduce uh, foam paddings of different uh, properties and see how uh, the skin would tear if we use the soft or if we use the stiff uh, or a rigid padding, how the force dissipates. Um, not only that, we were able to simulate different uh, impacts. So, you know, someone stamping on a player and pulling the leg back would uh, result in, in a skin, uh, skin tear. So um, the ability of... Uh, FB again is once you've validated the model, you can mimic different scenarios. And using this model, you can uh, test out different uh, scenarios of impact or different padding, which might be soft or uh, rigid and figure out, you know, if this should be allowed or this should be regulated or not. So uh, those simulations and the data from all our testing was being fed back to World Rugby to help improve the Regulation 12. So we, um, throughout our research, we have been working with World Rugby and the manufacturers to keep them in the loop of <clears throat> what we're doing, what we're suggesting, and what changes we might bring in the near future, uh, all to improve and ensure uh, the safety and 
uh, reducing the risk of injuries such as cuts and lacerations in the game of rugby. Uh, but RFE model has small applications. Well, uh, it can be used to study um, different sport where there is interaction between the human skin and um, other objects such as a ball or uh, sporting equipment that may be, um, or understanding the uh, interaction between the human body and the turf. There have been reports about how the uh, synthetic turf has led to more uh, skin injuries when players die or come into contact with it, or looking at the uh, human an anatomy and how the skin would change under different scenarios, or even at the medical uh, medical industry, so looking at different uh, surgical operations or any um, interaction between equipment and the human skin. Uh, and, you know, you, you could simulate those um, um, interactions, basically. So that's um, a small view into my research. I would like to thank all the technicians at ManMet for their uh, continued support, uh, all the manufacturers who have provided samples for us uh, to uh, help us carry out this testing, and above all to um, World Rugby for funding this research. Uh, thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really interesting um, talk, very short and sweet, as they say. Um, very interesting, and I believe that your work will continue progressing, and we do definitely look forward to hearing more about your work in the future. Are there any questions from our participants here? Yeah, I, I had a question um, for Adil regarding the, we had a talk from Manchester and mm -hmm. before about, um, I think, prosthesis and the use uh, of, of these, uh, you know, materials. And, oxidic liners. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's so. my professor, Tom Allen. Yes. Uh -huh. So I was wondering, so it, it is related, I mean, what you uh, learn from the padding in these particular uh, interactions can be useful for the development of new prosthetic devices? Yes, it can be used for uh, checking how the prosthesis devices interacts with the human skin and, you know, what different shapes would do to the human skin. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it is all transferable. Mm -hmm. And what, I had one question if, if uh, before I, I let you go. I mean, before I stop, um, have, how does the um, development of these new materials feeds into the regulations in rugby? Will, will they, for example, if you demonstrate that a certain material is not, uh, you know, it's not protective, can you feed this information to them and then they can change the regulation? But how long does it take and, and are you thinking of, is that what, what's going to happen? Well, they haven't changed the regulation in a long time, so that's why this research is happening. So uh, the, the contradictory part about um, the regulation that is in rugby is the padding shouldn't offer too much protection. So in every other sport, uh, you're aiming for more protection, uh, but the uh, the, um, the regulation here limits the amount of protection you can provide. So yes, anything that we are simulating right now is being fed back to World Rugby and the manufacturers to be like, you know, uh, this is where we're going to set limits. This is what this is what would be allowed, or this is what not will not be allowed. But then everything that comes into the regulation would undergo a trial period to see uh, what the effects are um, due on the game and on the manufacturer. So we're getting feedback from the regulatory authority as well as the manufacturers all the way throughout. Got it, so, thank you. So this FE model will inform World Rugby as well, but it can be used by the manufacturers to see if the padding they're designing, is it you know going above the uh, limitations that we're going to propose. Thank you. That's great. Um, we've got one question in the chat. Do the materials you develop 
is it patented or will it be? So we don't develop the materials. Uh, we develop the FE model that can be used to analyze the materials. So um, our development was the skin model, the uh, the muscle, uh, the um, biofidelic test bed, and the FE model that can mimic it and that can be used to analyze any material. We don't develop materials to uh, reduce the risk of injuries. That's great. Thank you. Um, two more questions for you. Very interesting topic. Uh, we've got a question on um, how accurate is the deleting element functions? Um, well, this is uh, one thing we are going for. So we used a skin which has a certain tear rating. Now, um, again, skin can vary between um, uh, um, person to person, depending on uh, gender, depending on age. Uh, but then what we're using is a, a chamois leather to mimic the human skin, and we are validating against that. Uh, so um, we've validated it against the synthetic chamois leather um, and it, had, it is a close match. We have to use different properties for different impact setup. Uh, but again, this model, the way um, the regulation works, the model will be used to check if it's reducing the risk of injury, not completely stopping it. So uh, if you use the same um, element deletion setup uh, without padding and with padding, it should give you uh, the ability to test if the padding is reducing the risk of injury or not. That's great, thank you. Um, and there's another question that says, does it um, does it have applications in bicycling and swimming? It it could do in bicycling uh, if well, it will involve falling off the bike maybe and then uh, uh, testing uh, if you know what extent of injury you could get um, it possibly could have an application in swimming I don't you know it is not an idea that comes right to the top of my head but if anyone has ideas do feel to send it out so it'll, it'll be fun to see where all it can be applied sure Thank you. And we've got a comment from Jesus saying we have a research project in the development of adjustable um, socks, uh, sockets. And so I guess that uh, there will be some um, for further collaborations on the background between you guys. So oh, happy uh, to. Thank you very yeah. much. Happy to. And hopefully I can visit Mexico one day and not just <laughs> see it from afar. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, that Thank was you for very having pleasant. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, we have. And um, sorry, I'll just continue. I've just received the comments now. A further comment. So this is from the same person. Um, that says we will prepare a proposal for you and uh, Lofra researchers in order to explore the possibility for collaboration. He obtained his PhD from Lofra, so I guess that uh, he will be contacting you um, yeah. with, with regards to that. That's great. Thank you very much. It's great to see that there will be fruitful uh, collaboration output from these talks, and that's exactly the purpose of these seminars and, com and com conferences. Excellent. Thanks again, once again, for your very uh, interesting work. Uh, we will move on to our third speaker, Dr. Chris, uh, Criseda Ruiz Aguilar. Um, she's an assistant professor at the Escuela Nacional de Estudios Superiores uh, Jeriquila and is responsible for Bachelor of Technology. She graduated from Instituto Tecnológico de Moria, Morelia as a material engineer. She obtained her master's degree in metallurgy and material sciences and doctorate in sciences in metallurgy and material sciences at the University of Morelia and receiving an honorable mention. She did a postdoc um, stay at the Instituto de Investigaciones uh, en Materiales uh, that is part of the National University of Mexico. 
Dr. Uh, Ruiz has more than seven years of experience in ceramic biomaterials with applications in the regeneration of trabecular and cor cortical bones, chemical synthesis, me uh, mechanosynthesis, powder metallurgy, forming of polymers, use of progens and 3D printing. In addition, she's worked in the manufacturing of physical, chemical, mechanical, and in vital characterization of res resorbable ceramic prosthetics, uh, including the synthesis and characterization of bone cements from the recycling of food industry products. All the areas of interest to her are nanomaterials, self-arranged honeycomb structures, and multi-layer films with applications in electronics. She has several international publications. She's also part of the National Systems of Research in Mexico. Great to meet you and great to have you here, doctor. And so without further ado, I would like to pass on the stage uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, did you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks again for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the topic entitled Biotic Calcium Fossil Materials Applied to Bone Tissue Engineering. Um, first, it's important to understand why a biomaterial is and its main aspect that must be considered for an adequate interaction of the host tissue. Um, according to the definition given by the American National Institute of Health, a biomaterial is any substance, a combination of substances, drugs, natural or a synthetic origin used for a period which were in place totally or partially any tissue, organ or function of the body promoting individual quality of life. Within the concept of the biomaterial, several stages um, can be considered or include, which are important to carry out the biomaterials development and each group of biomaterial characteristics. Um, consequently, they can be biometals, biopolymers, bioceramics, and biocomposites. Each group has unique properties according to the chemical structure, physical, mechanical, and structural properties. In this talk, I'm going to focus on bioceramics because they have the similar characteristics to the bone tissue. And then um, I want to continue to uh, development uh, bioceramics process. And in the first stage, consists of the synthesis or manufacture of this material. In this stage, all the physical, mechanical, chemical, and structural aspect of the bioceramics need to be most similar to the bone tissue to be implanted and to ensure a proper interaction. After all, the in vitro stage with and without salts is a study to understand the biomaterial interaction in simulated body fluids without cells and with cells. On the other hand, with cells, in this case, fibroblasts and osteoclasts allow us to understand the biological aspect as bioactivity, osteoconductivity, osteoinductivity, as well as the dissolution rate, the effectiveness, and the inflammatory response that the biomaterial may present. The in vitro uh, the in vivo sorry, stage permit us to study the bioceramics with animal models. It's important to indicate that according to the application, the animal model is chosen and is in, uh, a need uh, to perform to corresponding tests and then evaluate the biomaterial under dynamic conditions at different periods. As I expressed previously, the bioceramics, like the rest of biomaterials, must complete with and without vitro and in vitro aspect at mandatory to evaluate pH, biodegradability, cytotoxicity, sensibilization, calcinogenicity. All of these are directly related 
to the bioactivity of the biomaterial and the in vitro and the in vivo and without salts, as well as the interaction with bone osteoblastic cells can be synthesized the phase or the mineral phase of the bone tissue, among and many other aspects. So it's important to, to, to express or to indicate that the bioceramics can be classified into three large groups according to the interaction of the body of the person who contains them. The first group is the bioceramics, which form a fibrous layer that separates the host tissue biomaterial. A couple in love in a long distance relationship would be represent a trivial example of this group. On the other hand, the vajapti biomaterials are those bioceramics that form chemical bonds between the biomaterial and the host tissue. This process is named osteointegration. And the name will be an example will be in a couple in love who always stay in contact direct as a serial example. Finally, the new inert bioceramics are materials that can interact with the host tissue under certain conditions, but when they um, they are not uh, formed or they are no uh, uh, interact with chemical bonds, something like a couple in a free relationship and continue with the trivial examples. The bioceramics that I'm going to talk about are biotic biomaterials. Um, there is um, important to indicate that the biotic bioceramics can found in three presentations, like you can see in this slide. Um, natural, synthetic, and nano size origin. In biomaterials of natural origin, there are polymers and hydroxyapatite that come from the bone matrix. On the other hand, synthetics are the four groups which I mentioned previously, ceramics, metals, polymers, and compost or composites. Uh, in addition, to be in a subgroup is a hydrogels. However, it can be classified in the group of the polymers. The nano size, Bioceramics are natural or synthetic origin. Um, however, uh, they can be in these two different parts like origin, natural or synthetic, but bioceramics are the biomaterials that I continue central point. Some different uh, types of calcium phosphate like hydroxyapatite, beta tricalcium phosphate, bicalcium phosphate, tetracalcium phosphate, and biotic glasses are osteoconductive, which means that there are bioceramics that allow the stimulation and the osteogenesis cells on surface of the structures, wall, porous structures, resulting in a formation of a new tissue. Uh, subsequently, you can see in this video the bone regeneration process, having as a main actors the osteoblast, which are the cells that allow new bone tissue to regenerate, and secondly, the osteoclast, which are the cells that allow to reabsorb the bone tissue. Therefore, the osteoblast can deposit new bone tissue. There are other aspects to consider, which are the bone regeneration, uh, in this case of the process of the bone regeneration in porous structure, such as femur, tibia, fibula, since a wire distribution pores must be complete with that allow the vascularization of the implant carry out. There are a variety of methods of the synthesis and manufacturing bioceramics. However, considering the sustainable aspect as well as the cost benefit, the following synthesis method are mechanical milling, malquention technique, and soil health. All of these methods have the particularity that they are easy to perform, cheap, sustainable, with a high gel of the biomaterial. On the other hand, the manufacturing of the metals as original etching, polar technology, and polymer forming are technologies that allow performing bone implants with a precise finishing, tailored to every necessary to each people who require it. Um, 
The synthesis and manufacturing methods previously indicated are techniques that I have worked to the synthesis and calcium phosphate bioceramics and manufacture of the phosphate based bioactive classes. These two large groups of bioceramics have been as successful in the use of medical applications. Some commercial applications are in toothpaste, dental fillings, metal prothesis coatings in calcium phosphate. On the other hand, the bioactive classes have the characteristic that they are amorphous, but when they come in contact with the body fluids, they crystallize, stimulating the formation of bone tissue. Their commercial application with a greater importance has been in porous scaffolds for endoprothesis application to trabecular bone. Other crucial aspect is the bioceramics characterization. These techniques allow us to analyze the chemical composition, the physical properties like morphology, roughness, porosity, and structure. These techniques are emission scanning electron microscope, X-ray diffraction, infrared spectrometry using the Fourier transfer, testing the, uh, machine, and microtomography. On the other hand, the techniques used for in vitro evaluation are body fluid simulation uh, or pH, measurements, uh, field emission scanning electron, uh, microscopy, uh, Raman microscopy, calcium and phosphorus radio using energy dispersity or EDS, uh, X ray diffraction, plasma mass spectrometry, cell proliferation or MTT. On the in vitro stage or the in vitro, permit us to study the bioceramics with animal models, as I expressed previously, and it's important to specify that according to the application, the animal model is chosen to perform the corresponding test and evaluate the biomaterial under dynamic conditions at different periods of time. Um, it's critical to denotate that another techniques can be used for a characterization. Nevertheless, the techniques mentioned previously are the most used to characterize the bioceramics from the chemical, physical, structural, and mechanical and in vitro uh, characterization. Then I'm going to show some results of my research lines about the calcium phosphate and bioactive glasses. In this article was made a comparison between a soil gel mechanosynthesis techniques to synthesize beta 3 calcium phosphate and the results obtained in this investigation allow to understand the effect of the synthesis method and the particle size of the tricalcium phosphate folders. Uh, to conclude, the soil particles were lower than the mechanosynthesis, as you can see in this slide. And then the method uh, permit us to uh, understand the condition of the milling uh, time under the revolution per minute are variables that affect critically the particles of the tricalcium phosphate. Furthermore, uh, the field emission electron microscope uh, soil polders morphologies show spherical shapes that you can see concerning the mechanosynthesis uh, due to the gridding generating uh, agglomerates with irregular form. Then the X-ray diffraction verify the crystalline phase formation. This diffractogram corroborates the formation of the beta-3 calcium phosphate uh, due to the chemical reagents reaction in the solid state process. The calcium and the phosphorus radio in atom and atomic percent was corroborated by EDS. These polders radio values show from 1.4 to 1.8. This data indicates that the calcium phosphate, which allows to analysis and understand the dissolution of the polders in contact with body fluids. Some studies uh, have present abiotic glasses, doping with different elements and improved mechanical properties and reduces the dissolution process. Nevertheless, uh, Several compositions were manufactured of the bioactive bioglasses dubbed with zirconia or oxid, uh, zirconium oxide to improve the dissolution properties and the cell interaction in this uh, investigation. This slide shows part of the article results, which uh, 
illustrating the glasses amorphousness uh, and the irregular glass folders morphology. These images obtained by a scanning electron microscope. The last image show how that diffraction pattern with the tetragonal and crystalline structure was. Um, the zirconia interact a nucleating agent helping to the glass crystallization. Then uh, the bajafti glass folders were obtained uh, and mixed with beta tricalcium phosphate. Folders in variable amounts with different reagent, uh, forming reagents, radius, until obtain staffers with a wide pore size distribution. So bone regeneration could occur in long bones, such as trivia, femur, or fibula. They were having a wide pore size distribution and interconnect porosity. This aspect allowed to reservability, cell proliferation, vascularization, and a better control the scaffold distribution to be carried out. Um, for the porosity analysis, two day cuts were made using X-ray microtomography of the scaffolds, and then a 3D model reconstruction was made, as you can see in this video, which allowed to obtain the percent of the porosity variably from 49 to 52 percent. The range of the porosity is a consequence of the wide pore size distribution. Then. In vitro part, the scaffolds evaluation carried out with most fibroblasts to analyze the viability, the cell viability, showing a greater increase in the cell viability in amorphous or in a porous scaffolds than in the control sample. Then uh, I want to continue to show you uh, this article that is a continuation of the previous article, the scaffold percent. Um, a cauliflower like morphology, which is characteristic to the mineral phase of the bone tissue. Uh, can, as you can see in these images, hydroxyapatite can show various morphologies depending on the synthesis method and the body fluid in which the biomaterial is in contact. The stimulated body fluid of the SBF affects the dissolution of the scaffolds and release calcium and phosphorus ions due to the local saturation. This phenomenon generates nucleation and hydroxyapatite precipitation. The higher the saturation, the higher apatite formation will be, and the lower the saturation, the hydroxyapatite formation will be inhibited. This analysis of the pH variations as a function of the immersion time in the SBF or simulated body fluid allows to know the behavior of the medium on the scaffold dissolutions due to the hydrogen ions release permit to know the acidity effect and the alkalinity occurs in the medium due to the amount of calcium ions are released. It's important to comment that the hydroxyapatite formation occurs in pH values between 6.6 .6 to 7.8. The pH also allows to analyze the cellular metabolism. It prevents tumor formation of the cell's death. And then continues with the in vitro part. The scaffold were evaluated uh, in vitro with MG63 osteoblasts. The cell adhesion and the effect of the porosity of the scaffold is analyzed, and the sample with the higher zirconia content accelerates the proliferation, adhesion, and differentiation of the osteoblast, resulting in a better osteoconduction and osteoinduction. Then I'm going to show this on um, scaffold production using porogens. In this um, uh, a study the tricalcium for scaffolds production using sodium included spacer was used to obtain porosity results similar to the four uh, cortical bones. Then uh, obtain values of porosity of the 63% to 87%. Then continues with the um, scaffolds were evaluated and in vitro using artificial saliva to be used in dental applications. The hydroxyapatite precipitation was occurred of the 14 days of immersion in saliva artificial. 
In this study, on the other hand, the staff were manufacturing using two types of different commercial sugar. As you can see in this slide, you can show the different images of the two brands, different of Mexican brands, Sulca and Genuino, to, with, with the uh, objective to, uh, with different of sugar, pineapple amounts, obtaining uh, different structure with close uh, porous structures, which can be used for cortical bones, such as uh, vertebrae, schools, and phalange applications. Finally, I want to conclude by saying that I am still studying and completing the in vitro and the vivo test evaluations. I continue to synthesize and manufacture new and innovative biopsy glasses. And I continue to, to uh, improve about the applications of the bone tissue engineering. And I want to say thank you to all the co-authors and the students who participate in the different research. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, once again another very interesting topic. Uh, very good research. It's always great to see that there are so many good researchers taking place around the world and we're very pleased to hear them. We're very pleased to see that there are some connections uh, happening already uh, from these presentations. And uh, so having said that, uh, got no question from YouTube at the moment. Do we have any questions from the participants here? I had a question, if I may. Of course, thank you. Um, what I gather from, from your talk, Dr. Uh, Rhys, is that you want the material to become part of the, for example, for the for, uh, uh, part of the bone tissue, for example not to stay there but to contribute to its healing and then disappear or you want it to stay i mean or, or it depends possibly if you're using it for um i'm thinking about feeling for teeth for teeth you know to then you don't want it to go away you want it to to stay to become part of of the of the tooth but in, in other cases, you might want the material just to help heal and then disappear. Is that the case? Yes, I well, my all my lines of research, uh, they have the, the main uh, objective that just just a period of time and then disappear completely or reabsorb by the body who contains them. But if other applications are like a coatings in metal processes, mm -hmm. just to accept and evit to reject the, the mm -hmm. processes. So it's you well depends of the application and depends of the characteristics of the bone tissue in this case, because some part of the of the of the application or dense bones like um, spools and vertebrates like I saw dense don't have porosity inside mm -hmm. of them, but mm -hmm. alarm bones like um, fibia, uh, femur, or fibula, they need to uh, interconnect porosity because you need to into the fluids of the body mm -hmm. and need to go out all these um, parts that don't need to the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, yeah. I, I understand to be, to have um, adequate uh, blood supply, for example, you don't want something to block uh, the blood supply in, in a in a bone, no, in a long bone, for example. So I see, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Do we have any other question? We'll just give it one more minute so that maybe people type in.
Okay. Right. Uh, there seems to be no questions. I would like to once again thank you and the uh, rest of our speakers who contributed to our very, very nice day today. And um, I'm sure we all learned a lot today. And uh, there are some really interesting